good evening to everyone. Um, I hope you're here for a good time because we're going to have a good time tonight. Uh, I would like to say that we had a great time on today, um, fellowshipping, as I call it, with our young people, with our future, because they are the ones that are going to inherit this nation. Right? You should have said right or amen or yes or something. <laughs> so before I get started, I want to thank Ms. Juliana uh, Richardson for inviting us here um, I'm reminded of a, a definition of a mentorship that was given by Dr. Samuel Betance, a, a, a retired heart professor. He said, a mentor is a generous spirit who is wiser and willing to inconvenience himself to develop the less informed. And I think that that's an awesome definition. Um, it's the epitome that was stressed today from our um, distinguished guests, how they have so many busy schedules. My schedule is nowhere near as busy as theirs. And they've been doing this stuff for many, many years. I was thinking about the number of years uh, collectively from those three guys, uh, Dr. White, uh, Dr. Gladney, and um, Dr. Gates. And it's almost 100 years. <laughs> so that, and I've only been practicing. I got my PhD in 2001, so I'm a really a practicing physicist since eight, uh, about eight years now, going on nine years. So compared to what those guys are doing, it's a tremendous amount. So at this time, I want to introduce our guest, I'm your moderator for tonight, and the first uh, science maker is Dr. Larry Gladney. He hails from Cleveland, Mississippi. Mm hmm Yes, yeah, some of you didn't know that. So, oh, he's from East St. Louis. No, he was born in Cleveland, Mississippi, and was raised here in East St. Louis, uh, Illinois. He is a graduate from the East St. Louis High School in 1975, and I think some of his classmates are in the room. If you are, let me see your hand. Yeah, there's one, two. There's another lady here, too. Dr. Gladney went, uh, got his BA, BA degree in physics from Northwestern University in 1979 and went on to Stanford University for his MS degree, then his PhD degree in physics in 1985. He pursued postdoctoral studies at the University of Pennsylvania from 1985 to 1988. Now, he's received numerous awards too many for me to mention here. But I do want to say that he received the coveted Edward A. Boucher Award from the American Physical Society and the Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture Award from Wayne State University. He is also the chair and Edmund J. and Louise W. Kahn Professor of the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Help me welcome and receive Dr. Gladney. <laughs> Secondly, we have Dr. Herman B. White. He is from Tuskegee, Alabama. And I say that with emphasis because I was also born in Tuskegee, Alabama. We have such greats as the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes, George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, and Rosa Parks. And then we have Dr. Herman White and Dr. Darnell Diggs. <laughs> Dr. White is at Fermi National, Fermi National Acceleratory Laboratory for 35 years. He is the first African-American particle physicist appointed to the permanent staff there. He's worked in neutrino physics and kion physics and detective development. He's the first African-American physicist in history to have a mathematical equation named after him. That was an opportunity for you to clap your hands really, really good. His honors include the Afro P. Sloan Foundation Travel Fellow at CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, University Fellow at Yale University, uh, Third Illinois Industrial Cor Corridor Fellow, He's an adjunct professor at the North Central and vice chairman of the Board of Trustees for the American Physical Society. Two months ago, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Two months ago, he was named the American Physical Society 2010 Edward A. Boucher Award winner. They have something in common. Dr. Edward A. Boucher was the first African American to receive a PhD in physics. So that's a very distinguished award back in 18, in anything, excuse me, <laughs> first African American to receive a PhD in anything, and it happens to be in physics from Harvard. Yale, Yale. 
I'm going to get it together here. All right, he serves on a number of boards, the Board of Directors and Advisory Panels in, gov in Government, including High Energy Physics Advisory Panel and the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. He's a subcommittee of the National Academies of Science and Engineering and other agency. Would you welcome Dr. Herman B. White. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Dr. Sylvester James Gates, Jr. He hails from Tampa, Florida, and he finished high school in 1969 and furthered his education by attending the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT, and earning a BS degree, the BS degrees, excuse me, in mathematics and physics, and in physics in 1973. Gates remained at MIT for four more years, earning his PhD in physics in 1977. His graduate thesis was called Symmetry, Symmetry Principles in Selected Problems of Field Theory. I'd also like to add that Dr. Gates is a great teacher. I credit him to uh, helping me pass the, uh, my qualifiers for my PhD in physics in quantum mechanics. When I was at a conference, he taught, uh, did a tutorial in quantum mechanics, and he took classical physics all the way to quantum, and I just said, there's impossible for that to be that easy. <laughs> I say that to say a good teacher will make it just that easy and he's just that type of person. Dr. Gates in 1977, after earning his PhD, Gates went to Harvard University and worked as a junior fellow, fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows. He remained at Harvard until 1990, 1980. Gates then moved to California and served as a research fellow at the California Institute of Technology. In 82, he returned to MIT and accepted a position as a, an assistant professor of applied mathematics. Now he's won so many, so many awards too. He's also won the Edward A. Boucher Award. Uh, one thing I do want to say about Dr. Gates that he he was selected by doc, by uh, President Barack Obama to serve on his advisory board for science and technology. That's an opportunity for you to clap. <laughs> He's also won the MIT. M. L. King's or Martin Luther King's Leadership Award, the Washington Academy of Scientists College, College Science Teacher of the Year Award in 1999, the Woodrow Wilson Teacher as Scholar Fellowship in 2002-2003, and he received the key to the city of Orlando, Florida. How many of you guys have a key to your city? <laughs> so, in 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 uh, as a matter of fact, they proclaimed April 22, 2005, as Sylvester James Gates. Junior Day. So you need to mark your calendars for April 22nd. That's a national holiday, <laughs> according to Gates. <laughs> He's also a member of the Board of Education, the State Board of Education for the State of Maryland. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. James Gates? So ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're going to talk about how it all began. Many times people want to know, know the question, how did the universe come into being? Now if you're a creationist like myself and believe in Genesis, we said God said it and bang, it happened. But, then if, there, but there's a scientific component to it also. And we want to, we're going to talk about that tonight. Well, they, they are, they are called the three cosmic tenors and they're going to give you your, their spill on how the world actually came into being. I want you to bring your ears and your minds into covenant because your brain is about to be expanded because physics is an awesome subject matter to study. If you want to be intellectually strong, intellectually agile, multicultural, sophisticated, big and bad in your own right, you can study <laughs> physics. And these guys are going to show us that. So at this time, I want you to welcome Dr. Gladney as he comes to the podium first. Don't leave me. 
Well, I don't think you want to inflict me on the people for an hour and a half. That's all. Just be mercy. Well, thank, thank you to uh, the Science Center and to uh, science makers, uh, the history makers, for inviting me back home. I, I can't tell you how gratifying and how humbling it is to be back on home turf. Now, I have to uh, say that in my day, I can't leave without giving a shout out to those on the east side. So for those who came out, <laughs> thank you. And I have to uh, join with Doug King in saying when they first proposed that we do a lecture on physics, in fact, three lectures on physics on a Friday evening, I had my doubts. <laughs> but as all of you just found out just a few moments ago, physicists are very, very, very cool. So none of us should have been surprised. Now, I have to say that uh, when we talk about physics, Probably a lot of you, when you were contemplating coming to this, had it in your mind, am I going to understand what these guys are saying? And I have to say that for the three of us, the only goal we have tonight is that you don't leave with the same question, right? What did they say? So we're going to try and bring physics down to the point where we can talk about it as something that is a process, rather than giving you a lot of facts and a lot of figures. There will be some equations. Can't get away from that. But we're really going to talk about what physics is in terms of how people do it. And so you're going to see representations of physics as a science. You're going to see representations of physics as a way of thinking. And you're going to see representations of physics as something that people have always been engaged in. It's not necessarily something that comes across to you whenever scientists get up and talk to you because we tend to think of scientists as coming from a very narrow range of society. That is, we all have images of what a physicist may look like. And I suspect that none of the three, or sorry, that none of the four of us actually meet up very well with that image you had in your head. So let me begin by just saying that physics is for everybody. It is fun. And I'm very gratified to be here to tell you that tonight because in all of the things that we want to say to you to bring back to your own students, to your own children, it's to say that the life of the mind is an exciting one. It's a fun one. Everybody can learn physics. Everybody can learn more about how the world works. So let me begin what I'm going to say to you by asking the question, what is physics, and trying to give you an answer. So first, physics is about everything. Anything that you've ever wondered about how it works. Why does your car work? Why doesn't it work better than it does? Why can't it get more miles per gallon? Why can't we make gasoline for 10 cents a gallon? If you wonder why the sky doesn't fall, why do clouds stay up, why do airplanes fly, what holds the floor of this building up, why are the walls solid? All of these are questions that when you drill right down to them, at their essence, they're all about physics. It's the science of everything. Now, when I say everything, I have to give you the correct definition of what we mean by everything. And so you'll see four words up there behind me on the two screens, matter, energy, space, and time. So matter is this, everything. You are matter. Everything around you is matter. The light that's shining on my face, that's shining on the screens, is energy. The electricity that's powering the computer that's, that's putting this display up, that runs on energy. And so space and time are the place where matter and energy hang out. We have space so that not everything is in one place, and we have time so that not everything happens at once. So we can ask a question now. If physics is about everything, why do we bother having any other science? <laughs> So let me give you a very crisp answer to that. You are made of matter. However, if you get sick, you do not want Dr. Gladney as the person that you come to for a cure, OK? So it is the science of everything, but we have to be a little careful to try and narrow down what it is that we talk about, because things get very complicated very, very fast when we talk about things like people, plants, animals. Those kinds of matter are certainly things that we can talk about from the perspective of physics, but we got to take a particular viewpoint about what the physics is in those things. So you'll find physicists doing almost anything. Uh, as I uh, heard from my, one of my colleagues yesterday at the American Physical Society, 
when uh, the eight physicists in the room could not understand why the, the uh, loudspeaker wasn't working correctly. And there's nothing so embarrassing as having eight PhDs in a room who can't figure out how a simple piece of equipment that any nine-year-old can figure out how to work isn't working. And at the end, what we discovered, as one of my colleagues pointed out, as I said, is that there were more explanations than there were uh, solutions to the problem, okay? <laughs> so what we wound up doing was yelling pretty loudly for the rest of the meeting and foregoing the speakers. But uh, the statement that ended that was, physicists are never afraid to talk about anything, right? But what we have to do is to actually go beyond the talk and then figure out what really makes it work, what's the mechanism that's behind things. So I'm going to give you a perspective on two of these things, and those are going to be amplified on by uh, Dr. White's uh, talk, and then you're going to hear a summation about how this all works from the theoretical point of view, the life of the mind, from, uh, from Dr. Gates. So the two things we're going to concentrate on in physics in order to narrow our view of the science of everything to something that we can cover in the next hour or so is to talk about things like the science of the very small. So what happens if you take matter and you break it into the very smallest pieces that you can? What happens if you take energy and you break it into the very smallest pieces that you can? That goes under the name of something called particle physics. Now, if we try and say, as, uh, as was pointed out by Dr. Diggs, what happens when you want to make an entire universe, then what we do is to take the small pieces and we try to figure out how they fit together in order to make a universe that looks like the one that we live in. And that's called cosmology. Sometimes it goes under the name of astrophysics. So the questions that I have up there are the ones that I want to try and very quickly take you through in, uh, in about the next 20 minutes or so. Okay, so first, before I do that, I should probably try and justify to you why it's at all interesting for you to be sitting there and listening to me try to answer those questions. And so let me say that the very first one is practical. Physics is about practicality. It actually can give you solutions. Uh, the eight physicists in the room yesterday weren't very effective at that, but usually we're much better at giving you answers to problems that people actually would like to have solutions for. So every discovery and every invention that you depend on in order to be here today, to find out that this lecture was taking place, to, uh, to travel here, at some point you were making use of physics that was about questions very similar to the ones that I just put up, okay? So, for example, the electricity in this room, it comes from a machine called a generator, which takes motion and turns it into electricity. When Michael Faraday, who invented this around 1835 or so, first showed it to the Minister of the Exchequer, uh, essentially the Treasurer of England, and the, the uh, Treasurer of England says, well, what good is that, making electricity? Who cares about that? And Michael Faraday's answer was, I don't know, but I wager that someday your government will tax it. <laughs> and he was exactly right. In fact, you do see on your bill every month a tax on electricity. Now, one of the other things that came out of asking, well, what's the nature of electricity and magnetism? Two things that people up until around the 1850s, 1860s, they knew that there might be some connection between them, and Michael Faraday in the 1830s had kind of shown one connection, but they didn't, again, have a practical use for it. Well, in 1865, a uh, theorist um, by the name of James Clark Maxwell came up with a theory, a set of equations that explained how electricity and magnetism work, and then just a couple of decades later, out came radio which is simply a manifestation of the fact that I can cause a spark over here and make another spark over here. And so it didn't take very long for people to realize that even though it doesn't look very practical when you show it to people for the first time, somebody gets into their mind the idea that if I can make something over here affect something over here, there ought to be a way to make something very useful out of that. So radio, TV, all the things that we depend on from things like GPS satellites, they depend on a theory that was written down in 1865, okay? And it was a theory that was motivated by asking questions, what are the fundamental nature of electricity and, and uh, magnetism? Now, I put up GPS because this is a personal favorite of mine, and I'm sure that pretty much every husband in the audience knows this. One of the great problems with driving with your wife is that 
They're constantly asking you to ask for directions because you don't know where you're going. Well, I got to tell you, I was liberated when I got a GPS system for my car because the very first thing I said when I brought it home is, you can never ask me again to ask for directions. I will never be lost ever, okay? The GPS system, however, can give me directions in my car and say, you need to turn in 300 feet. But no matter how much engineering, no matter how much technology goes into those satellites, it would not be able to give me an answer that says turn in 300 feet without the theory of gravity from Einstein. Few people know that, but to get the accuracy that's really useful for people who are driving around so that they're not turning into the car shop window, right, requires a theory of gravity that was written down in 1916. And the last example I'll put up is, again, one that most people don't really realize came out of people who were asking the questions that I had on that second slide, which is the World Wide Web. This was created solely by people who do particle physics so that people who are working in different countries could communicate with each other very efficiently. And now, of course, it's found one or two other uses which uh, people have, have learned to appreciate. Now, sometimes, because I know there are some students in the room, and all of us should be students, even those who are 93, I'm sure, are still learning. Uh, we have to ask the question, what do we personally gain by doing this? So beyond sort of the practical, what is it that makes us better as individuals when we study physics? And so I put up a couple of examples of what to me were personally very motivating. So the first is that we're all born as explorers. When we're children, somewhere between the ages of zero and three, we have to learn how to navigate the world without hurting ourselves or other people. We learn not to walk into walls. Uh, we learn after the first try not to stick a fork into the electric socket. We learn that it's easy and not painful to be hit by a feather, but you don't want to try the same experiment with a bowling ball, okay? These are all physics things that we got to learn about how the world works. And because of that, we have to become explorers almost as soon as we're able to move about on our own. Now, the only difference between scientists and other people is that we never left that childhood. Okay? The scientist is the person who not only continues asking those questions, but continues to try and find out the answers. It's not a very big separation, therefore. I say science is for everybody, physics is for everybody. It's because we all do have some fascination with the way the world works, because there is so much about the world that is unknown to us. And we're fascinated by the unknown. Every amusement park is built on the fact that we're exhilarated by the things that scare us. And the unknown typically is something that we find exhilarating, a little bit scary. We don't know what's beyond the next bend. And the explorers are the ones that we want to hear about, the ones who actually traveled out, figured out how this works, blazed a trail, and then came back to tell the rest of us. Now, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite quotes from Einstein, and you're going to see his picture a couple of times in my, uh, in my talk, is the one that you see before you, which explains that the essence of motivation for creating beauty, art, and science all comes from that same mystery of the unknown. It's actually to explore places that people haven't actually explored before, to touch on things that are unique to the human condition, but which haven't been properly explained in the way that the individual artist thinks that they should be presented, or the way that the scientist thinks that they need to be explored. However, there's something else, and this was, again, for me, something that was very personally motivating. Growing up in East St. Louis, I lived a lot in my head. Now, um, if you don't believe that, you can ask those who are here who knew me in high school who can already tell you that in the last five minutes, you've heard twice as many words from me as you would have heard for my entire high school career. Okay? <laughs> and the reason I lived in my head was because it was very, very exciting there compared to where <laughs> I actually grew up. It was a much more interesting place to be. I live for the future. I thought I was going to grow up and fight robots on Mars, right? Those kinds of things were my first imaginings about what physics was like. And then came the moon landings and Star Trek and all these other things from people's imaginations that spurred me on. But the thing that I learned eventually is that when you are exploring, you are free from all the things that keep us down. If every part of life is only about solving the problems of today. What do I have to do to make a living? What do I have to do to get my kids to school? These are all things that we have to live with, and we have to do them. 
but they can't be all that life is about. And exploration is one of the ways that we escape because we actually are exploring places that are just a little bit more interesting than the ones that we may have to deal with every day. Now the other thing is that we actually do know a lot. And so one of the other things that I enjoyed about physics was actually learning that there were answers to questions that nobody I talked to could answer before. How many kids have asked, why is the sky blue? How many people know the answer? Well, let me tell you, the answer's been known for a century, more than a century, right? We understand exactly why our sky is blue and why the sky on Mars is pink. It's a simple matter of physics. So learning these things, again, was very gratifying personally because I was just never aware that people knew the answers to these hard questions. And you hear the questions, but very rarely, unless you were in a physics class, could you get an answer to these things. So personally, I feel very gratified by the fact that I can be a physicist and that I can not only answer some questions, but there are many, many questions that I can't answer, but I can explore. So let's start our exploration tonight with matter. And so what I'm going to do is to take you very quickly with a very powerful microscope through the progression of matter. Take any piece of matter that you want, hopefully some piece that nobody cares about, so that you can cut it as many times as you want and try and look. How many times can I cut it before I get to something that is uncuttable, which is the actual definition that the ancient Greeks had for Adam. So what you see behind me is a, uh, a picture of what happens when you take matter and you multiply it so that you can see what it looks like at the very smallest levels, okay? And so at a certain point, when we get down to around 1 30 millionth of an inch, we start to see molecules, and we all learn about molecules in chemistry. If we look still further, we see that the molecules are in fact made of atoms. The atoms are electrons and a nucleus. All of physics that has to do with chemistry and with biology is tied around the properties of molecules and atoms. So in particular, if we talk about the uh, periodic table, then the periodic table gets its properties from the properties of physics that apply to atoms and to molecules. Now, if we go still further, we get beyond what we can say with a table that looks like this one, because this one is actually relevant for biology, chemistry, and so forth, but it's not the most fundamental thing that we can talk about. And when we say fundamental, it means it's not the smallest bits of matter that it applies to. So what we have to do is to, uh, if we can get this to go forward, what we have to do is to turn the microscope power up, go back to the atom, and see that inside it's something called a nucleus, and the nucleus is made of protons and particles called neutrons, and if we look still further, we find that the protons and neutrons actually have smaller things inside of them called quarks. And the quark and the electron, so far as we know, down here at 10 to the minus 18 meters, that's one billionth of a billionth of a meter, this is as powerful as our microscopes can go, and as far as we know, these are the fundamental constituents of matter. In other words, you can't get any smaller than that. Now, that's not to say that when we build more powerful microscopes, we don't know that we won't see anything smaller than that, but we have no clues right now that would indicate that there are anything smaller than that. So what I would say is that what we've got is a picture now of the fundamental building blocks of all matter. Everything is made of quarks and electrons when you get right down to it. Now we can do the same for energy. Uh, now energy is a little bit more tricky, so I'll have to, uh, again, if we can get this to go, spend a little bit of time explaining how this works. And I'm not going to take you through a lot of technical details except to say that energy is something that it's very hard to capture. Right? Matter I can put in one place and it'll stay there, but energy tends to flow. It tends to continually be on the move, and it moves very, very rapidly, usually at the speed of light. So for energy, when we try to say what's the smallest bit of energy that we can have, we have to use indirect methods, but those methods work every bit as well as the microscope that shows us the smallest pieces of matter. So what we see is that if we take light and we break it into its smallest uh, constituents, its smallest pieces, we get something called the photon. The smallest packet of energy that involves light is a photon. 
We could do the same, we think, for gravity, although nobody has actually been able to do the indirect experiments that show that. But we believe that if we did it for gravity, we would find something called the graviton. And then we have, actually, for these two things, done the experiments, again, indirect experiments, that show that the smallest pieces of energy that we can get for forces inside of the nucleus are, again, particles. And we can identify what their properties are. So at this point, what we've got is what we think, again, to the limit that our technology can go, is a pretty complete picture of matter and energy. Now, if we try and say, is this complete, as I said before, we can only work up to the point at which we are able to explore with machines that we know how to build. And when we say that we know how to build those machines, then what we can do is to say that at least to the extent that the physics we can look at is understood, these two labels cover everything. There's one other thing that I have to produce, though, which is to say that matter and energy in and of themselves are not the whole story. And that's because, as we were shown by Einstein, matter and energy can convert one into the other. So the most famous equation in the world in physics, at least, is this one, E equals mc squared. And all it means is that the things that are on this side can, under certain conditions, change into the things that are on this side. And the things that are on this side can, again, under certain conditions, change into the things that are on this side. All right, so that's a complete picture of everything that we know about energy and matter. And from there, we can start to make a picture of what the universe looks like by building up from those fundamental building blocks. So I'm going to say right here at the beginning that uh, we're not going to challenge anybody's theology here, but here's where we think physics is telling us the universe began, a blaze of energy about 13.7 billion years ago. And that energy started from a point much, much smaller than the head of a pin, and it does what energy does. That is, as soon as it comes into being, it goes in all directions. And as it expands, it cools down. And as it cools down, some of the energy starts transitioning into matter. So it starts to make electrons and it starts to make quarks. As the universe gets bigger and bigger and older and older, some of the quarks start to glue themselves together. And they start to make uh, protons and neutrons. And then after a little bit more time, the protons and neutrons become the nucleus of atoms. They capture uh, electrons. And then you have atoms. And those become molecules. And then you work your way up, and what I'm going to say with a wave of my hand is the entire universe that you know today, okay? <laughs> so there's the picture. You've got it all. Okay. Now, there is a new periodic table. I'm not going to go through it, but just to say that the quarks don't come in just two types. These are the ones that we need, but there seem to be these other ones which are around, which we don't quite understand the... Uh, the uh, purpose for, but we know that they're there and we know that they're a part of the ingredients. So we don't have a complete picture here, but we have enough to sort of say that we actually understand a lot about how the universe came into being. Now, of course, I can't end right there because if it were that easy, then Dr. Gates and Dr. White and, Dr. and I would be retired already, okay? <laughs> and uh, to quote Dr. Gates, I intend to live forever. So. I'm not ready to retire just yet, <laughs> right? We're not going to get old just yet, so we have to do a little bit more. So what I'm going to do is to say that to make this concrete, let's assume that what we've got is a script. It's a script for how the universe came into being and how it developed from its birth to about 14 billion uh, years later where we are right now. And that script is written by particle physics, that is, by breaking matter into its smallest pieces, energy into its smallest pieces, and then seeing how they glue themselves together to make a whole universe. Now, this picture got a whole lot more complicated a little over a century ago because it turns out that, of course, I haven't said anything about space and time. Again, if we can get this to go forward. Maybe the battery's getting a little loose here. Okay, there it goes. About a century ago, Einstein complicated things enormously. Um, and he, 
he's the kind of person who can do that for you, right? He can take a perfectly good theory of physics that's worked for centuries and he can tell you, no, no, you've been all wrong for that entire time. You've been mostly right, but it's only an approximation. Now, when he said that about Newton's laws, which are the laws that had prevailed and were thought to be the end all of physics uh, up until around 1900, he made life a whole lot more complicated because he said space and time have to be included here. You can't leave them out. So imagine now that I've given you a screenplay, but now I have to go back and correct the screenplay to account for what Einstein said. And the equivalent of what Einstein said is matter and energy are like actors on a stage. The stage is space and time. But now, whenever the actors move around, the stage moves with them. It changes shape. It warps. It deforms. So when two actors happen to be close to one another, the stage changes between them. If they happen to move apart, the space between them might increase or it might decrease. The time on the watch of one actor might be running at a different rate than the time on the watch for a different actor at another part of the stage. It's an enormously complicated thing to have happen. However, as with everything else, as a physicist, you never get too depressed about these things because whenever one complication comes up, another simplifying idea makes itself available, an opportunity. Right? So this is what we call a teachable moment for physicists, which is to say that what he also told us is that I can look at the stage, that is space and time, and by looking at the shape, I can tell you what matter and energy happen to exist in that vicinity of space and time. That's a very powerful idea. It's one that's really only come into fruition almost a century after Einstein said it, right? So his theory came up in 1916 that told us this, and it's going to be about a century later before we can actually make optimal use of it to explain a story that seems very complicated right now, which is that if every form of matter and energy changes the shape of the stage, how does it do that? Because it emits gravity. Gravity is an attractive force, but in Einstein's term, it's not a force at all. It's simply a way of telling space and time how to change shape. So if I can look at the shape of space and time, I can tell whether there's matter or energy in the vicinity of the place where I see the change in shape, whether that matter and energy is visible or invisible. So if we think about it, what Einstein has told you is that if you can tell me the shape of the stage I'm standing on, I can tell you where the matter and energy is, whether I can see the actors on the stage or not. It's an incredibly powerful idea. I mean, when I first heard this, I thought, well, how cool is that, right? <laughs> Even if something's invisible, I can still see where it is. It's like it leaves a shadow that we can pick up, whether I can see the matter energy at all. Now, how does it do this? Well, the details of it are a little crazy, which is gravity bends light, and it bends it like a lens, literally like a lens does to light. You can deform the shape of objects by having something very massive, very heavy in front of that object. So for example, here we have red, blue, and green. These are supposed to represent galaxies far out in space. But there's something invisible right here at the beginning, right here at the middle. I've colored it white so you can't see it. It's invisible. But if I were to actually do this experiment, I would still be able to tell that it's there because you notice that the red dot has been deformed. So when I actually look with my telescope, this is the shape I would see and not this one. And that tells me that right here at the middle is something very, very massive, invisible, but still there, inescapable in its existence. So even invisible stuff can no longer find a way to hide. Now, as a practical question, you might say, well, who cares about that, right? <laughs> if it's invisible, why do we want to see it? Okay. Well, here's the answer. When we thought we had the story of the universe written out, we had written down this script in terms of quarks and electrons and the Big Bang, and then we find that when we actually apply Einstein's theory to look at the shape of space and time out there, it turns out that what we see indicates that only 1 20th of the universe is actually visible to us. Now just think about that. For centuries, we've been studying matter, energy. We've been working hard, tirelessly. And uh, I have to tell you just a little anecdote about tireless. When I say tireless, 
I really mean working hard. The lesson was brought home to me by a Nobel laureate, Burton Richter, who was uh, one of my advisors in graduate school. And I got on his good side, so he wrote me a very good letter when I, uh, when I went to Penn. And I'm convinced that it wasn't because I was so smart. I'm convinced it was because he understood that I understood how hard you have to work in order to do physics. Now, what's an example of working hard? Someone who's a senior scientist, he's got the Nobel Prize in physics. This is now, at this point, almost 10 years after he won the Nobel Prize. Who are the only two people in the laboratory at 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning? The Nobel laureate eating stale popcorn for breakfast that was left over from a meeting yesterday, and the graduate student who's trying to get his PhD. And he wasn't a man of very many words. He's still around. Uh, but he tended to talk in very gruff terms. And the gruff terms were not his personality. He's actually a very nice person. But, well, unless you're on his bad side. Uh, but he's, he's gruff because he wants you to listen to what he says. Everything he says is important. And therefore, if he's telling you something, he wants you to listen. And when you say it gruffly, people tend to listen. So at one point, he said, when is that thesis of yours going to be done? And I made the mistake of saying, well, it's almost there, but I want to make it better. And he repeated something to me that reminded me an awful lot of what my mother said to me when I was on my way to, uh, to high school, which is, what do you mean, make it better? A thesis can only be better if it's finished. <laughs> The thesis that exists is a lot better than the one that you're making better, okay? Now, his way of saying that was to say, hmm, I'll bet you're thinking that you're going to write a really, really good thesis, and that may be true, but let me tell you, a thesis doesn't have to be good. In fact, it doesn't even have to be right. It just has to be done. I took the message to heart, and I was out nine months later with my PhD and a very nice letter from Bert that I think probably said something like, he did it, okay, which is about all he had to say. All right, so when we see a problem like this that we've been studying for centuries and all the stuff that we've been studying, all the stuff that's in this room, all the stuff that we look out to uh, when we see the Hubble Space Telescope pictures, all of that is only one twentieth of what's actually out there according to Einstein's theory of gravity, then we know we've got something that we've really got to go after. And we can't rest until we understand what the mystery is. First of all, how much is there, OK? And what kind of stuff is it if it's invisible? And it turns out that we can answer that question, at least part of the question. So we know that there's a form of matter by doing these experiments, which is what we call dark matter. Now, I have to say that physicists are not very creative when it comes to naming things. So instead of just saying invisible stuff, uh, or Tom or Harry or Dick or whatever, we just say dark matter, right? And that sounds technical enough to actually confuse people who don't actually keep up with this stuff, and it's just technical enough to make graduate students think, hmm, I need to, need to understand what this is, but I need to know what to call it in order to ask a question. Well, now, the question is dark matter. It's a form of matter completely unlike any that we're able to study in laboratories on Earth, but hopefully, uh, Dr. White is going to tell you about a machine that may actually be able to make dark matter here on Earth for the very first time. But it turns out that even with this new form of matter that's invisible and has properties very different than those of quarks and electrons, that's not the complete answer. And so there's another form of stuff that's invisible out there. Again, if we can get this to work, we'll be able to see it. And it's something that actually is so weird that we don't really have an explanation for it in any terms. Now, we give this the very creative name, dark energy, OK? But we hide that, because that didn't seem very creative. So we call it exotic. Now, um, exotic is a code word that I think in most fields translates as pay attention, OK? Whether you're talking about dancers or physics, if it's exotic, <laughs> it tends to catch your attention, right? It's strange stuff. This stuff actually has anti-gravity. It makes things go away from it rather than attracting it to it, which is a very, very, very strange thing to do. But in fact, if you go back to 1916 and look at Einstein's theory, there was one part of the equation 
that allowed for, when you applied it to the universe as a whole, that allowed for repulsive gravity. So the question that we wanted to ask is, does this exotic kind of energy exist? And the answer is yes, it actually does. So we're now able to look far enough out in space with the latest set of telescopes that we can see that instead of slowing down, which is what we expect for the universe as it expands, all the gravity from all the matter inside of it should be causing the expansion to slow down, it's actually speeding up. And it's been speeding up for roughly about five to seven billion years. And the only way we can explain that, at least in any way in which we're able to keep some part of our sanity, is to say that there's stuff that has repulsive gravity. We call it dark energy. And so I'm going to end by just saying, I can't give you any explanation for this. Uh, Dr. Gates might be able to give you some kind of a clue as to where it might come from, uh, from string theory. But in fact, we don't actually have any explanation for this. So this is why five years ago, I switched from doing particle physics at accelerators, which are very powerful microscopes, and switched around to building telescopes to look further out into space in more detail so that we could see the existence of this stuff and try and figure out what it is. And the way you figure out what something is, is you first figure out how does it work? That is, what are the details, the mathematical details of how it works? Once we have that, then I can guarantee you that we've got 100% of all of the stuff that makes up the universe, but I can't tell you what the properties of about 95% of it are just yet. So there are people that are working very hard on answering the questions as to what this is. I'm working on experiments for the future that can try and explain at least what the properties of this stuff is. And maybe between the two of us, we can come up with an explanation for what's going to be the new quarks and electrons for the future. So with that, let me turn you over to Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. Gladney. There we are. Well, good evening, and uh, thanks very much for coming to listen to our presentation. I uh, escape. Outstanding. Good. I'm just going to close this and bring mine up. Everything's a test, you see. Once you have to figure out how the computer works, if you can't get it to work, they take your PhD back. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, what I'm going to do is to uh, present you a presentation here on smashing atoms. Um, now, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gladney gave you essentially the foundation by which we're asking some of the more fundamental questions that exist in nature. And it begs a, another question, and that is, how do you get to the point of actually doing the science? How do you make these measurements? What actually do you have to do to be able to answer any one of those questions? And we have a lot of confidence that we know about the standard model, about the particles that make up the standard model, and all of the things that Dr. Gladney told you about at the very beginning. Some of this will look like it's the same thing that he said. However, the perspective I want to give you now is the perspective of the size, the scope of how we actually do high energy particle experiments. Not necessarily particle experiments that might be done by looking at cosmic radiation coming from deep space or, cosmic, or, or types of particles that might actually be a part of the greater cosmos. We believe they're the same type of particles. What we try to do in elementary particle experimental physics is to do those very same experiments in a controlled environment in our laboratories. So I'm going to tell you about some great moments in physics, which he's already told you about, but I wanted to fill in a few gaps the composition of the universe and how we search for these types of structures within accelerators and the energy frontier, the frontiers that we are now posing to do on, the, on our planet and in our laboratories. There are three basic frontiers that we've now identified in terms of being able to make the case for how we support this kind of science. They are the energy frontier, 
the intensity frontier, and the cosmic frontier. Now, you've just heard a very good presentation, and thank you, Dr. Glatney, about the cosmic frontier. That is, the cosmic frontier essentially looks at the entire universe. It takes in all of that is part of understanding the size and the composition of the universe. However, the energy frontier is the frontier that you need to have to be able to probe some of those particles and produce them on, or should I say, below the Earth. Now, the history of the universe that Dr. Gladney showed you before uh, is pretty much the same picture that you see here. The one thing I want to point out here, however, is even though this is exactly the same sort of thing that you just heard about, the question is, how do we get to the energies that are necessary to reproduce some of this particular dissociated particles in our laboratories? Up here, what I've showed you essentially are some of the accelerators that we actually build in various parts of the world. And these accelerators are used essentially to reach back in time. Now, he told you about the Big Bang, and there's an idea that the whole universe, space, time, matter, dissociated matter, all started about at this point, whatever that point might be. But to get back to that point, we actually go to higher and higher energies in our particle accelerators. And these particle accelerators can be used essentially to probe very deeply into the structure of ordinary matter. And in that probing, we produce these secondary particles that gives us an understanding of how they are produced and how they actually interact. As was said before, um, it's an old idea that the smallest constituents of matter or any matter have things inside of that matter. So take an ordinary piece of anything and you can have subconstituents of that particular material and subconstituents sub sub of all the materials made after it. Being is made of atoms, and that is essentially a, an old idea that seems to actually work because we've been able to identify things as a function of the cons uh, construct that we look at. These are questions that little children ask, and ancient, Greece at, ancient Greeks ask the same problems. Today's physics Physicists sometimes seem to, to ask some of the same questions, except that we have the capability of answering them and answering them in a reproducible fashion. Let me point out that physics is the observation that's reproducible. If you, in fact, are doing a certain scientific experiment, and you can do that experiment in a lot of different places at a lot of different times, and you get the same answer, then you can actually have a lot of confidence that that answer is, is in fact, mimicking or at least presenting to you what nature really wants you to see. There were great moments in physics over the period of time that actually we've talked about. Um, this happens over a number of centuries. And I'm putting this slide up so you'll get an idea of not only the scale of what we do, but the time frame by which we do it. Sometimes you can have a discovery and certain ideas that are presented but you don't actually have an understanding of those particular ideas or the applications or the impact that they may have for many, many decades. And you can see that little pieces of the puzzle of how we understand how things are done get put in place a little bit after a little bit after a little bit. The periodic table is just one of those examples. This is what we actually have for atoms, but what we have in terms of the structure of those atoms are things that we know, as has been said before, that cause us to have a confidence that the atoms are not just static material, but they have subconstituents, and those subconstituents are the things that we want to actually have access to. Let me point out something, and you know, I, I have to tell you a, a few stories about myself in terms of how I got into this business, but this is what we are actually trying to do when we build large accelerators. We try to get to the point where we're actually looking at the subconstituents of the atom and the subconstituents of the nucleus of the atom, the subconstituents of the protons and neutrons, the quarks that have been talked about. When I was a, a student, uh, well, actually a Sloan Fellow at the Central European Laboratory in Switzerland, I had the opportunity in 1972 to make a comment to a rather interesting person that I wasn't so sure about the quark theory. Uh, Mr. 
Victor Weisskopf, who was president, who was actually the dean, uh, the, the chairman of the department at MIT, invited a number of students to have lunch with him. Um, and I made this statement um, at the same table that a gentleman who was there for a year was sitting, and his name was Murray Gell-Mann. Many of my fellow uh, contemporaries said that I was, uh, I, I ended my career right on the spot. Uh, because they interpreted my statement as being, well, you know, you're questioning quark theory. Now, of course, Mr. Gell-Mann had just won the Nobel Prize for quark theory. And, uh, and I uh, spent the rest of the day with him, uh, right by his elbow. Everywhere he went, I went, and uh, to try to redeem myself. And I did redeem myself, but it was basically an understanding that he had that I didn't. And I was told later on that you should either read more or you're more or you're very, very smart fellow. I decided I would read more. <laughs> what we have in terms of understanding the basic building blocks of nature is the standard model. Now you've just heard a little bit about this. We have matter particles, which are six quarks and six leptons, and that's they're fanciful names that we actually put together to try to actually put all of the particles that we need to uh, to identify and put these particles together to make everything else that exists in the universe. One of the problems, and you heard about the electroweak force and the strong force from Dr. Glatney, but there is a question, and the question has to do with the size of these various types of particles. What we did experimentally was to find these particles in our laboratory. We produced them in various experiments around the world, but at Fermi Laboratory, which is my laboratory, we discovered the top quark, the bottom quark, and the tau neutrino. Now, it turns out that this is a great discovery, except the, the top quark was much, much larger than in mass than we thought it was, that it was supposed to be. In fact, it was so large that it mimicked essentially the size of a gold atom. And the question that one has to ask is how can something that has no geometry, that is so incredibly small it has no shape, no size, can be as strong, as energetic, as massive as an entire atom. And the story actually leads to even a bigger question, and that is, how does any of these fundamental particles get their mass? They're different mass. Some of them are very similar to each other, but the masses are different. And what we decided was that there must be another particle that needs to, in fact, be connected with these particles or coupled to these particles that give them that mass. This is something that we're actually looking for in our experimental program. We are not satisfied with this standard model. It has survived for 30 or 40 years, and you'll hear more about that in the next talk. But the truth of the matter is we need to be able to understand why these particles have the characteristics that they do. And we have not completely solved that problem yet. And so we are building these large accelerators to be able to do that. One of the things that we have to deal with in building accelerators and building detectors is to understand the size of things. Now, what I want to do here now for at least five minutes is to tell you essentially about the structure of atoms from the point of view, not of their components, because we've already told you about that, but from the point of view of the size. Because that makes a big difference in terms of what kind of detectors you build and the characteristics of the detectors necessary to do this kind of science. Take into consideration this structure of the atom. The atom is on the order of about 10 to the minus 10 meters. It has essentially a nucleus, which is composed of these quarks in the guise of protons and neutrons. And the size of the nucleus, as you saw in the previous talk, essentially gives you an enormous amount of mass and an enormous amount of material right at the center, and then the atom itself is extremely large in consideration. Now, the space between the edge of this atom and the nucleus is essentially empty space. To give you an idea that's a little bit better than that, how tiny is this particular structure? Protons, with their tiny quarks inside of them, could be thought of in the following manner. Magnify a pinhead to the size of the Earth. You know, just take a pin, think of it as being the size of the entire Earth. Then the atom is about the size of a house. And you can think about a house on the Earth and the size of the Earth, which is not so big. And then the nucleus of the atom is the size of the penthouse of a, pin, a pinhead inside of that same house. 
That gives you the range. So the question is, how do I build a detector to be able not only to understand that size, but to understand anything that comes out of our, our experiments that's new? Because basically you have to measure the characteristics of particles to be able to say that you have new ones. So we use particle accelerators to do this, electrons, positrons, protons, antiprotons, that is particles and their antimatter partners, and accelerate these particles and the particle accelerators and smash them together at very high energies. Many different particles are created in these collisions, and the higher the collision, the more massive the particles that we create. I want to get to the point where, we actually, where I tell you about the detectors, because I don't want to run over our time. Let me tell you essentially about two accelerators that exist. There are many accelerators that exist. In fact, if you have one of those old televisions, you know, the televisions that have a pitcher tube, well, inside of the pitcher tube is an accelerator. There is a particle beam that goes from the back of the pitcher tube and sweeps around the front of the pitcher tube, and then you see a pitcher as a result of it. Now, so when you tell your children, don't sit so close to the front of the television, that's exactly right. They're looking right into the eye of a particle accelerator. This is the highest energy particle accelerator in the United States, and until about three weeks ago, the highest energy particle accelerator in the entire world since 1972. It's characterized by a series of clustered accelerators that take particles and start them out and then accelerate them in stages all the way up to the point where they go around this four-mile circumference synchrotron, which is a superconducting accelerator that accelerates particles to the energy of approximately one billion electron volts. Now, to give you an idea of what that means, remember that television I was telling you about? The particle accelerator in your pitcher tube is 25,000 electron volts, 25,000. We start out the particles in our accelerator at 750,000 electron volts for the first stage of the acceleration, and then each stage that we produce goes up to much, much higher energies, 400 million, 8 billion, 150 billion, and even antimatter particles at 8 billion, and then the Tevatron, which is a superconducting accelerator, at one trillion electron volts. Now, up until a few, until last year, this, in fact, was the place where you actually did some of the experiments to try to understand the basic building blocks of nature, because you had to go up to energies that were very high. Now, I'm not going to, to make this too complicated, but we actually take a particle beam and we hit it on a metal target. And the process of taking this particle beam, hitting the target, produces these secondary particles that we then measure, and that's essentially the way we do particle accelerators. Now, this is an animation that shows you the two ways in which we do that. First, we take the particles and we send them into a target, and on the other side of this target, you get essentially new types of particles that are made, and we put these particles in magnetic fields and produce a detector that allows us essentially to make, and make measurements of their properties. Now, we see these particles by looking at their collisions, measuring directions and charges and energies, and tracking the way in which the particles actually move, and there are very complicated ways of actually doing this, but in a practical way, it's essentially a simple thing of playing pool. Now, I'm not saying that I went into particle physics because I knew how to play billiards, but for the most part, you take one ball, you hit another ball, it goes off into a hole, and then you know essentially where it's supposed to go. So if you close your eyes, hit the same ball, and saw it go into one of the holes, you know what happened. Essentially, that's what we do here in terms of these particle experiments. But we have detectors, instead of the place where you, you, you pick up the ball, that allows us to essentially find out what the properties of the particles that are produced are. The best detector that you actually carry around with you all the time is your human eye. This is, in fact, a photon detector. It, it essentially is capable of light going in, and there are certain receptors in your eye that allow you essentially to see. And in fact, these particular things, I think, right here, allow you to see in color. So the idea with regard to detectors is to be able to have the properties that you're looking for, amplify those properties, in detectors and then catalog all of the information that you get 
so you can get a consistent reproduction of the observation. That's what we do when we ionize, um, um, when we ionize materials with particles traveling through it. These particles can gain or lose electrons, and as a result of that, they become ionized. This is helium, for example, and this is an ionized uh, helium atom. What happens is that a particle that we're trying to study goes through, knocks out one of the electrons, and the particle, the material that's left, is something that doesn't have a balanced charge. So we can actually do things like collect it. We can actually put it in magnetic fields. Excuse me. We can look at all of the properties of this, of this uh, uh, material as a result of the particle going through. And this allows us to track the direction that the particle that we're trying to study is making. We build large detectors like that to do the work that we're doing in particle physics, but you have this in your home every day, and it's called a smoke detector. Not unlike this thing I just told you about, basically you have some metal plates, an ionization chamber, so you have a certain balance that exists within this detector, and when you get something that goes in that unbalances it, it sets off an alarm. So these are the same sort of ways in which we actually use to make even much more complicated detectors. In this particular case, these detectors actually are designed in such a way that they look at specific type of particles and specific type of characteristics of those particles, whether they have charge, whether they don't have charge, whether they can be absorbed very easily or not absorbed at all. These are various types of characteristics when you fold them into a large detector allow you to essentially see all of the things that are there. One thing that is not understood, or at least not have been understood, is the contributions, and we talk about Einstein a great deal. This is a photograph of Albert Einstein at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Now, of course, you think Albert Einstein got the Nobel Prize for doing work in relativity. That was one of his great contributions. But actually, he got it for something called the photoelectric effect which we use in detectors. It is a way in which we actually understand something about the production of electrons after they interact with photons, after some materials interact with photons. Here he is actually teaching a class or making a demonstration at Lincoln University with a class of uh, African American students. I happen to run across this picture um, at an a exposition in Chicago a number of years ago. I'd never seen it, never heard about it, but I wanted a copy of it. So I asked the people there, and they said, oh, you have to go to the Einstein estate. You have to go through all sorts of things, which I did, and finally got a copy of this. And, it, and actually, I have a letter that allows me essentially to put it in a talk like this because it's actually owned, and it's owned by the Einstein estate. But the last executor of the Einstein estate, who died not too recently, actually wrote me a very nice letter, explained the whole thing, and said that I had permission, and I'm the only one, that has permission to actually use this particular picture. The physics, I like the picture actually. The physics drivers that we actually do, uh, and this has to do just with the accelerators, and I'm just about done. The, the type of work that we actually are engaged in, in being able to identify particles and identify the characteristics of those particles require us to build these very large and very small or very large particle accelerators. They are very complicated machines, and now I'm just going to give you, in my closing comments, essentially an understanding of the size of these machines and how complicated and difficult they are to build. We do two things. One is that we have the fixed target experiments, which allow us essentially to take a particle beam and hit a stationary target, or we can take matter and antimatter and collide those particles together in one particular system. Here is a demonstration, basically, of what we do in terms of what we call colliding beams. If you have the energy of the particle beam going into a stationary target, you only have the energy of that beam. But when you have particles that are going in two different directions, when they hit head on, they produce enough energy in the collision to be twice as much energy as you would have if it was just a stationary target. These are known as colliding beams. And we build these colliding beams accelerators at Fermi Laboratory, which has the world's only superconducting matter-antimatter collider, and also a new machine that turned on a few uh, weeks ago at the Central European Laboratory, which is known as the Large Hadron Collider. 
I want to make two points uh, in my closing. One has to do with the fact that our field is highly international. You cannot do this work in your basement. You can't <laughs> really do it in your university's basement. You have to have a basement that's about four miles in circumference if you're at Fermilab and 27 miles in circumference if you're at the CERN laboratory in Switzerland. We also use the entire planet as part of our experimental um, uh, program. Uh, we do work with neutrino physics, and here I give you a demonstration basically of uh, one of the more recent discoveries that were made having to do with the nature of the neutrino particles that I talked about earlier. We sent a beam of particles, of neutrino particles, from our laboratory at Fermilab, which is about 38 miles west of Chicago, into the Sudan mine in Minnesota. And this is a, a means by which we can actually study the character of the neutrino because we think it actually oscillates into some of the other neutrinos. And we have been able to actually reproduce this particular information, but I want to point out that it was first seen by our colleagues at the Supercomio Kande detector in Japan by looking at the, at the neutrinos that come from the sun, well, neutrinos that come from space on one side of the planet versus the neutrinos that come from space on the other side of the planet. Now, they should be the same thing if, in fact, you're looking at the same particle. It turns out, in fact, that they are different. And in, when we actually saw this particular um, phenomena, this was actually a tremendous discovery that reinforces the idea that the neutrino did oscillate or change its character. Now, it turns out we reproduced that, that information with our detectors here uh, from Illinois into Minnesota. Had we, of course, done that earlier, then we would have gotten a free trip to Stockholm instead of the people at Super Kamiokande. To give you an idea of what that detector at Kamiokande looks like, these are people in a boat inside of a detector that has thousands of phototubes, the same sort of things that I was telling you about earlier, and they fill this entire detector up with water. So when the neutrino particles, which are weakly interacting, come in, they make a little bit of light and we collect all of that light with these, with these photo detectors inside of the, the detector. The detector is very large. Let me also uh, mention that there are some open questions in particle physics, the origin of mass, dark matter, which you've just heard about, and matter and antimatter. One of the things that I've done in my life, and certainly I received the Boucher Award this year, had to do with new interactions with matter and antimatter. And we uh, spent about 10 years of our, our work uh, trying to answer some of those questions. But the future questions actually will be answered by the Large Hadron Collider. This is a 27 kilometer in circumference and 50 meters to 150 meter depth superconducting accelerator, not antimatter, but just protons and protons that travel between the Geneva, Switzerland, and French border. This is the size of the, of the accelerator itself. It, will, it has turned on and it's operating now, what you see here essentially is the size of the, experiment, the, the, the experimental facility at Fermilab. This is the size that we have at Fermilab versus the size that we actually have at the Swiss, uh, at, uh, the Swiss research facility. There are a number of experiments that are engaged in doing this work. They're extremely large experiments. They're extremely large detectors. Here you see a normal sized person. This detector is approximately 7,000 tons. And these are normal size uh, man and woman. Uh, and the idea with this detector, just like the ones I've told you about in the past, is to do exactly the same thing. You hit particles in the middle of this detector. They produce secondary particles that are then, then detected by many of the components of this uh, large uh, uh, detector. This give you, gives you an idea, and when you're talking about particle physics, you're talking about really, really big physics. We use the entire world if we can, and we use whatever we can to be able to understand the very smallest building blocks. And you have to have something this big because nature has very, very tight reins on the structure of matter. The origin of mass will probably be decided by looking for the Higgs particle, which is called the Higgs particle. Some call it the God particle. And this, um, if you look at, if you saw angels and demons, um, they were doing antimatter and that sort of thing. At 
It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> the amount of antimatter that they showed in that picture would take approximately 81 million years to produce. We actually did the calculation because we know how much antimatter we produce at Fermilab, and we produce most antimatter that exists on this planet, or at least in this local part of the universe. So I said that only for the following reason. Many of the questions that have to do with matter, antimatter, and how particles get their mass may be actually answered at the, at the Large Hadron Collider. It started up on time, uh, and this is some of the events that you actually see in doing that experiment. This is what it looks like inside of the accelerator. Uh, it's a, a very, very large machine. I suppose if you were a jogging person and you wanted to jog 27 kilometers, this would be a very nice place during the winter time, as long as it's not running. Um, and then, of course, you can see essentially what some of the detector uh, looks like when it's actually operational. Let me finish by saying that the international facility and what we actually give to the rest of the world in terms of our, our work is tied in specifically to the fact that we are a global collaboration. We have people who are engaged in our work, and for the young people out there, if you want to see the world, this is the way to do it because you actually have a significant number of individuals from just about every continent, just about every nation engaged in high energy particle physics. This gives you just a just a small example of the member states that run the Central European Laboratory, some of the universities within the United States, uh, I'm sorry, the user observational um, uh, nation states throughout the world, and of course other states that have individual people who are engaged in particle physics. The last thing I want to say is that the things that we do as individuals in terms of understanding particles, antimatter, will make an impact on your life. We already heard about the World Wide Web, which was generated as a means by which we could move data from Fermilab, well, from the CERN laboratory to the United States. And we also have things like antimatter, which actually are very useful for being able to do medical diagnostics. I was very lucky to be able to engage in medical uh, work uh, as a director of a hospital corporation and I'm very happy to be able to say that the contributions of a particle physics to that are very substantial. We also do work in uh, protons and neutron cancer therapy because we discovered in 1948 that you could use these particles to essentially um, treat uh, localized carcinomas. So in conclusion, let me say that we continue to smash nuclei that make up our universe, and every day we learn something entirely new. So I'm going to give it over to my colleague, Dr. Gates, who's going to tell you not only about the things that are new, but the things that will be new later on. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. You know how Sometimes you go to church and the preacher's up there going and you start to get a little bit tired and the preacher doesn't pay any attention <laughs> and keeps going and going and going. Amen, <laughs> well, I fear that you've learned tonight that physicists can behave like preachers. I have um, been asked to move the program along because my colleagues have found their presentation so wonderful, <laughs> so illuminating, so enjoyable that they indulge themselves to the fullest extent possible. So I'm going to deviate actually from my presentation. First thing I'm going to do is try to be kind to you folks. Why don't you stand up? Thank you very much. <laughs> so in my deviation and in my attempt to move the program along, I am not going to use my PowerPoint presentation at all. 
I'm simply going to speak to you about a few issues and talk about uh, what's really behind all of this, this voluminous presentation that you've heard so far tonight. The first thing that I would tell you is about the nature of science itself. I believe that there's much confusion that many people have about what we do as scientists. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. And I think this is an important discussion to have because you, the general public, actually pay for the kind of science these two have told you about tonight. And so it's your decision about whether this science goes forward. Now, you don't normally think about it as your decision, but your congressperson, your senators and representatives, they're the people who appropriate money for this kind of science. And I don't have to tell you that our nation is suffering economically right now, that there are millions and millions of Americans who are having difficulty maintaining homes, finding jobs, looking out for their family. And so in the face of this, I think it's a valid question to ask, why do we spend money on science? Well, let me begin with a, a story that I often tell people about how I think about science. And it's a story that happened to you, but you won't remember it. I don't remember it happening to me either. You see, all of us are born into this world not knowing anything, not recognizing anything. There's a cacophony of sound that, you know, something's going on out there. There are these blurred images in our field of vision. Imagine being a baby one or two days old, if you can. What must the world look like to you? You don't even have an organized way to think about this place. You just have the experiences. But at a certain point, after your mind becomes conscious and you begin to organize your thoughts, even before the gift of language is bestowed upon you, there is an instant when you look typically at your mother and you know that that particular image is somehow supportive of your existence that that particular image comforts you, feeds you, removes pain from your existence, keeps you warm, and that's a magical moment. We all have that moment someplace in our past, but we never remember it. What does this have to do with science? Well, you see, science is the way that our species organizes looking at the entire universe. We are much like that newborn infant without even the language or the concepts to understand what our mother, the universe, looks like. So that instant that you first recognize your mother as a almost conscious being, that's a magical instant and science provides the means by which our species is continually doing that, looking at the universe. That's what science is for. Now, science is a very strange thing when you look at how it interacts with humanity. Because many times people will come and talk to people like me, and this was even alluded to twice in the presentations by Dr. Gladney and Dr. Diggs, how does your humanity, uh, in some sense, how does your physics allow you to remain as a person? And in particular, this is a very pressing issue for many people about religious questions. And the thing that Dr. Diggs will tell you is that many of us who are scientists see absolutely no conflict between religious belief and our science. And you might wonder how that's possible. Because many people, in fact, mistake what science is about. So let me talk about this. You see, in science, the idea is we don't know anything. And we must question our mother, the universe, 
to get answers. Now, in order to understand those answers, we put some restrictions on ourselves. We say that if we ask a question today and mother gives us an answer, then if I ask that question tomorrow, mother should give me the same answer. And if she does not, I cannot use that to define science. You see, science is not this overarching inhuman thing that is done to us in trying to understand the universe. It's a very human construction, and it has limits. And one of the limits is reproducibility. I ask the question today, I get an answer. If I ask the same question tomorrow, I need to get the same answer. If I ask the question uh, 20 miles from where I am, I need to get the same answer. That defines science. The other thing about science is it's not just a collection of facts. Because oftentimes people think science is what you find in science books. And I always tell people that's like walking into the studio of a great sculptor, looking down at the floor, turning around, walking out the door, and when someone asks you what a sculptor does, you say, oh, that's a person who makes big piles of rocks into little piles of rocks. And if you believe that, you have missed the entire point of what was going on in the sculptor studio. So when you look at a science book, what you're actually looking at is the results of science. Science itself is a process. It's that process of our continually querying Mother Nature, the universe, trying to understand how we are connected to her. This actually protects science and religion from each other, interestingly enough. Because you see, for those of us who are science, the only things we can tell you about are things that we can measure. So if there is an infinite being, do you really think you could measure him, her, or it? And that's the barrier that keeps the two separate. And this is the thing that I, a lot of us scientists constantly fight against is when people say religion and science are at loggerheads. No. Einstein said no. In fact, essentially all of the great physicists have said no to this. Earlier tonight we heard mention of James Clark Maxwell. Maxwell was the scientist that gave us the equations to understand photons that we heard about in Dr. Gladney's presentation, the scientist who allowed us to understand how photons enter eyes. In fact, the amazing thing about Maxwell is that in the 1850s he figured out how humans see in color. That's how long we've understood why we can see in color. But Maxwell was a devout Christian. One of the three greatest physicists in all of history was a devout Christian. Now Einstein, yeah, this guy's a little bit flaky. But if you read his philosophy, he always talks about the mystery of the place in which we live. In fact, we heard a quote. And often he refers to the ancient one. Now he wasn't religious in any conventional sense, but there was clearly some deep spiritual beliefs at work in Einstein. And I encourage all of you, any of you, to go out and begin to read what he had to say on spiritual questions. The final thing I would like to tell you about science is that we need you. We need you desperately. Our world and our civilization faces perhaps the greatest threat short of something catastrophic like a meteor strike, and it's called the global warming period in which we live. A lot of people would like to deny it, but for us scientists, all the best available evidence suggests that we are the cause of the in average increase of temperature on this planet. It's not a natural cycle. And I know if you read in the papers, they say there's all kinds of controversies. There's no controversies among the scientists by and large. It's like saying 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there was, you might have said there was a controversy about whether cigarettes cause cancer. Well, there were people who wanted you to believe that, but those were not the scientists. That was a settled issue a long time ago. 
So when you read about science and why we need you, is we need you to understand first the limits of science, but we also need you to be actively engaged in consuming what scientists are saying because ultimately you're going to be responsible for the scientific decisions made by this country. And we need you to make good decisions. This crisis that we face now is in energy production. The ways that we have produced energy for the last 100 years, mainly using carbon, burning wood, burning coal, this is, seems to be the most likely reason the average temperature of the Earth is increasing. In order to solve this problem, it's going to take some science. We are going to have to be able to produce energies cleanly and affordably for people. And so for young people in the audience, the greatest thing that I can do for you is to say, pick up this burden. Because this is a burden that if we do not solve the quality of life for millions and millions and billions of us humans on this planet will be an utter disaster. We also need you, the general public, to understand and engage in this very difficult question and push our government into engaging in solutions and finding solutions. So the final thing about science that I like to say is that science, in particular Albert Einstein science, has given us an exquisite understanding of how we fit into the universe. The charts that my colleagues have shown you, this one I will do, and then this will be my last point. There is an image which I find incredibly beautiful in telling our story. And by our story, I mean the story of our universe. It looks like this. It tells us that something happened about 14 billion years ago. We call that something the Big Bang. Now, we don't know what was the cause of it. In fact, science cannot answer the question about what caused the Big Bang but we can only tell you that all the available evidence says that it happened. About 300,000 years after the Big Bang, an amazing event occurred. You see, before this event, light was not free to travel throughout the entire universe. It was locked up with the electrons and the atoms. It was tied to them. But as the universe spread out in size and temperatures and densities dropped, light could freely flow through the universe and for the first time, there was a dawn. Now, this event is called the Cosmic Microwave Background. And in the 1960s, we started seeing this thing. In this museum, there are many, many displays of dinosaurs out there. And they make it very hard for people, for anyone to say, dinosaurs never existed. Because we've got the bones. So you can't say dinosaurs didn't exist. And yet, you go back 50 or 60 or 70 years, and there were lots of people, uh, people of faith, who said, no, these creatures could not exist. But we had the bones. Well, you see, we had the bones for the Big Bang also. It's called the cosmic microwave background. And if you had eyes that could see in microwave, you know, the kind of energy used to heat up your food. That's a form of energy. We heard from Dr. Gladney about the energy in the universe. If you could see a microwave, you would look up at night and spread across the heavens. You would find those bones from the Big Bang. That's how definitely sure we are about these matters. And so our universe grew. and. There were enormous transformations in energy and space and time. And yet, in all of this 13.7 billion years of change and transformation, the universe created exactly one copy of you. Think about what that means in terms of preciousness. And if the universe puts all of that work, all of that time, all of that energy into creating exactly one copy of you, how then are we able to disregard each other? Thank you.
So, I guess you all would agree with me that physics is hot. <laughs> Can you imagine having that type of physics teacher? Many of you guys probably said, oh, I wish I was a physicist. How many had that, that moment? Look, at, you see that? That's awesome. Let's give our guests another round of applause. Yes. Thank you so much. That's awesome. You know, you know, I was just I was sitting there listening to those guys talk, and I just want to know who told that lie that African Americans cannot do science. Don't feel uncomfortable, because people do say that but it's called lie-based thinking. I did want to acknowledge Arthur Townsend. We were celebrating him, so I was going to ask him to stand so you can know who he is. He made a 31 on the ACT. I acknowledged him because he was inter he's interested in physics, so we're a little bit biased towards him, too. So at this time, we're going to open it up to you if you have questions for our, our panelists. Um, you can just stand up and uh, raise your hand. I don't know if there are any mics available. If not, then you can um, make sure you project. Okay. I have a question. This isn't, oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Eventually, for us to have, be able to go into space, without having to worry about gravity, and if time travel is really a possibility. <laughs> yes, okay, so that one is so easy. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. White to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a joke about Einstein um, that I'd like to tell before I answer the question. So once, uh, apparently, Einstein was uh, giving talks uh, around his home, and uh, he had a chauffeur. And the chauffeur stood at the back of many, many of these talks, and he heard it, heard what Einstein had to say. And so once they were on their way to a presentation, and the chauffeur was talking to Einstein, he said, you know, I've heard you give your talk so many times that I can give the talk. <laughs> so Einstein said, really? Let's try this. So they trade places. Einstein pretends to be the chauffeur. The chauffeur pretends to be Einstein. They go into the presentation. The chauffeur gives a talk. It's a brilliant presentation. Then there's a question and answer much like this. And so one person stands up and asks the chauffeur, who he thinks is Einstein, a question. And, this, and this, this false Einstein says, oh, that question is so easy. I will let my chauffeur in the back of the room <laughs> take care of that question. This is how I feel right now. <laughs> to answer your question scientifically, there are two things I can say. If the equations of Albert Einstein continue to be regarded as an accurate description of how our universe works, the answer to both of your questions are no. But you notice I put a big caveat in there. I said, if. In fact, people like me and my community, I work on something called string theory. Um, it, sometimes I, I like to think of it as the DNA of reality. You can Google that if you want to see what it means. But if the equations of string theory are very different from the equations of Einstein, then maybe Star Trek is not science fiction, but a prediction about our future but we won't know until we understand the equations. I can say that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of the guy who makes the measurements in this group. Um, and we, there's something called symmetry uh, that exists in nature. Um, it has to do with mirroring, it has to do with matter and antimatter imbalance, and it also has to do with what we call time reversal invariance. And you can actually make measurements in particle physics 
the idea that we have that a reaction will go in one direction and using antimatter, it's exactly the same reaction going in the opposite direction, that is, time reversed. Uh, we've been able to make these measurements and we've found certain odd effects. So uh, Dr. Gates is right in terms of the fact that you can't make a direct measurement on some of these issues, but you can in fact make the measurement on the symmetry. And if the symmetry does exist the way we think it does uh, within our universe, then we can decide whether those balances exist or not. And we found some very, very small, odd effects that shouldn't be there for certain types of things. But putting all of these symmetries together, we have a coherent understanding about symmetry in the universe, and it works. Um, but we do, in fact, do measurements. I've done measurements myself, and people have done them for the last 40 years to actually test this every single experiment to make sure that we still have that coherent symmetry. If we don't have the symmetry, then we have to go back and start the, the work again. He's going to add something to that. I'm going to say one other thing, and it goes back to trying to make sure you understand what science is. You see, in science, we can, ne we can never have complete certainty. And that's something that humans are very uncomfortable with. They would, most people prefer to feel certain about things than to admit to uncertainty. So in physics, whenever you ask a scientist a question, what we will give you as the answer is our best understanding according to the best measurements we can make at the time you ask the question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And so in some sense, that's conditionality. We're never completely sure about anything, but we always try to take our uncertainty and limit it to a, a small a possibility as can be realized. So that's why science is not absolute. That's why it's not a threat to other things. Yeah, yeah. I saw your hand right here. Yes, you. Yeah, you, yeah. yes, you. <laughs> I know what the other means. <laughs> uh, since you brought up, uh, can you all hear me? No, we need the mic. Since you brought up the topic of science and religion, I would like to ask, how would you respond to someone, uh, since all three of you mentioned that the universe is 14 billion years old, how would you respond to someone who felt the universe was 6,000 years old? Or how would you convince someone or educate them as to the evidence of that or, say, evolution? places where we're in conflict? Well, <clears throat> I've, I've given some talks at religious institutions. I'm a Quaker, um, and many times uh, people will actually be uh, somewhat confrontational about those issues. Um, I would say that, you know, with the Big Bang, and this is, you know, the microwave background that uh, uh, that Jim was talking about, and the understanding, in fact, that we can look at certain types of radiation that come back from the beginning of whatever it is that we measure. We don't, we say the beginning, but that's all we say, just like we say that the universe is expanding into something, uh, or expanding because we can define the edge of the universe as being the universe. It's a banner of definition. But usually, in, in having discussions with regard to religious faith, um, I've been able to make suggestions to individuals that I'm not an arrogant person. Um, if you say that I know exactly how the universe was produced, um, then you're also saying that you have a point of view with regard to your religious faith. But my point of view is that, well, the universe does exist, and I don't know that God didn't use the Big Bang to do it. And if, in fact, you understand how it was done, then you should be able to explain that. What we do in physics is to say, this is what we observe. These are the conclusions that we draw from that observation, and they're not in conflict with anything having to do with a matter of faith. Another school of thought is this. In Genesis chapter number one, you see it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it goes on to say, the earth was void and without form. But we know that everything that God creates has life and is productive. So something had to happen between Genesis 1, verse 1, and then and verse 2. We don't really know. So for even, I'm a Christian, don't make no mistake about it, and I'm a minister. 
as we can guess. Yes. Not a surprise. As we can guess, you see, they kept saying, they kept saying when they were talking uh, in my closing, in my closing, and I was saying, I'm wondering how many doors that sermon actually have. <laughs> I think I saw a hand over there. The, the lady is standing. First of all, I just wanted to say that I was very pleased as a fellow scientist to hear you all spout the science. And that's been good. But I have a quick question that can kind of hopefully help to motivate young people. Of your role models that you had, be them African American scientists or non African American scientists, could each of you tell who those role models were? Um, it's a very difficult question. It took a long time for me to actually uh, believe in the power of role models. Um, so growing up, I would say that uh, my image of what a physicist was was no, in no way, I think, uh, impactful on my decision to be a physicist. So it took a long time for me to come around to the idea that you make a positive impact by having a role model. What mattered most for me was knowing that people who think about these things are out there, that they exist. And it was only by teaching that my students made me aware that role models are really important. So what I would say is that you can become a scientist without having a role model. Uh, you can become president of the United States without having a role model. But you get a lot more people who are trying to become scientists and trying to become president of the United States when a role model actually exists. I would just echo, echo that, um, certainly in the community that, that I grew up in, which is Tuskegee, Alabama, um, we had a number of individuals uh, historically in that town who were exceptional people who did uh, exceptional things. Um, there are people I always felt who were pioneers, but I never wanted to do what they did. I understood that uh, basically the idea was that anything you wanted to do, you should be able to do it. And uh, if you pioneer and decided you wanted to be a particle physicist and you're the only one from Tuskegee, Alabama who's done it, then so be it. But uh, it wasn't anything that motivated me um, as a person to look at someone else who was doing that particular work. Um, my first role, well, like uh, Dr. Gladney, it took me a very long time to understand what a role model was. And the reason for that is because I had had so many of them as a young person, I didn't notice. The first role model in my life was my father. My dad never finished high school, did 27 years in the US Army, had an absolute iron commitment to the fact that his children, his four children, would go to college. It was never a question around our dinner table of whether you would go to college. The question was, what college would you go to? <laughs> and secondarily, I think uh, there are two other people I would name, and when I look back, I can figure out they were role models. I didn't know it at the time. One of them was my high school geometry teacher, a woman by the name of Miss Edna Williams. Uh, one of the things that we suffer in this country today for uh, about is uh, the quality of education that goes on in our schools, and there's much distress about it. About the time I was in school, and I graduated in 1969, schools were often very, very good. And they were very, very good because there were lots of women, qualified, amazing women, who made the schools very good. But the other role model that I have from that period was my physics teacher, an African-American gentleman by the name of Mr. Freeman Coney. So when I look backwards, I could figure it out. But going forward, I was clueless. And my role models were my parents. And, um, and I say that my mom, and I, I'm from Alabama, rural Alabama. And I grew up in the country. And um, my father couldn't read or write. And can you imagine that kind of darkness? You know, I actually saw him sign an X for his name, and my mom then had to write her name next to his name, then sign his name for him. 
And my mother, she didn't, she had an eighth grade education. Now, most people say, now how in the world can you have a brother that's a chemist, a chemical engineer, a brother that's a mathematician, and you'd be a physicist from a family like that? Now, they could not transfer me the necessary academic survival skills to succeed in school, but what they did instill in me is the value and the need for education. And they did not tolerate bad grades. And my mother never did, went down to the school and showed out on the teachers. Y'all quiet, because some of y'all parents probably have done that. My child didn't do this, my child didn't. <laughs> but you know, and, and seeing that, and then also seeing how they worked so hard. My mother, you know, actually she took me and my twin sister, well, my mother and father had 11 boys and four girls, so it's a lot of us. And I have a twin sister. And my mom took us to the cotton fields and had us pick cotton, put cotton in what they call a crocus sack. Anybody know what that is? And you know, we was like, oh, we can do this, we can do this. Me and my twin sister and my brother, we were like, we can do this easy. And we got the, we got the bag like almost you know, halfway full. And my mom got in the bag and just jumped in there and began to jump up and down in the sack. Just said, now go pick some more. And I knew then <laughs> that I, Darnell Diggs, did not want to do that type of work. That's a good lesson. So they were, they were role models for me. I think I saw, let me get you, the, the long lady here, and I think I saw a hand over here too, Which over one? there. Let me get her, and then I'm gonna get you, because you hand a bit for a while, then I'll get you. Um, how can religious scientists believe that um, dinosaurs existed for many years before humans did? Because the evidence all points to that. You see, the universe is not a place that is arbitrary. It actually apparently has rules. Science is the way that we uncover those rules. And all of the evidence that we suggest see says that dinosaurs were here hundreds of millions of years ago. There's no evidence of humans hundreds of millions of years ago. And again, the same, the same same uh, school of thought, you know, something had to happen. You can read about it if you have a, what they call a Dake's Bible. Um, even when God said, you know, replenish the earth, which means that we have to do something over again. We don't know, but we do have the evidence, as Dr. Gay says. Uh, I think it was you, your hand over here. No, the lady here. My question is, uh, what type of activities would you recommend to parents uh, of young children that want to encourage them to uh, pursue the field of science? What type of uh, books or games or, you know, something that they could do while they're at home to encourage that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that you can do is to make sure that, um, and it's something that I have to continually tell my college students and even some of my graduate students. And so I know that somewhere along the line, there are a lot of people who must be somehow giving the message that it's the opposite of that, which is that there are no silly questions. There are no stupid questions. If you're curious, then you can say, let me help you try to find out the answer to that question, as opposed to saying, that's not a question that I can deal with. That's a question you have to go to someone else. So what I think is that, as Dr. Gates mentioned, and, uh, and Dr. Del, uh, Dr. Diggs mentioned, that our parents give us the lessons that we need in order to succeed in anything. It's so important that they give us the lessons to succeed in science by saying, not, this is not something I can help you with. This is not something that you come to me with. This is something that you asked me. You're curious about it. It's important. And so I'm going to do what I can to try and help you find the answer. And I can tell you that now it's so much richer in terms of information out there because of the internet than when you had only encyclopedias, which you may not have been able to buy. But my, my mother spent seven years with green stamps to buy encyclopedias so that I could have answers to questions. And it wasn't so much the encyclopedias that taught me how to, to learn to love physics, per se, or how to love science. It was the commitment to say, I want to help you find out the answers. And let me just 
end on one other point here because, again, you hear it so many times that you must say that there's active forces out there that are producing this mindset in people. For girls who are 12 and 13 years old, there is a very critical point at which they turn off from science and math. There's lots of evidence from that, for that in the literature. And so I think we have to start accepting that there are lots of hints that are given to them that say science and math is not for you. No one ever told me you cannot be a physicist. No one ever told me you cannot be a scientist. But I had a whole lot of people tell me, why would you ever want to do that? And you only got to say that once to a child who's in a tender age before they get the very, very strong message that this is not for you. So each of us, not just the parents, but the people who are in the schools who are teaching, if it's your grandchild, it's so easy to give the message without ever saying you can't do this. It's so easy to give the message, but it's not for you. Uh, it was you over here. Keely. Okay, thank you. Um, I, it's been really thrilling tonight. And I just want to ask if there's anybody in the audience that thought these three gentlemen were going to sing tonight. <laughs> I tell you, that's uh, why the three I, came tenors. Out. I came out. I said, oh my God, they've got voices and they're smart. <laughs> True story. I mean, that's why I'm here tonight. I wanted to hear some voices, but I've been uh, really uh, treated in spite of that. Um, uh, I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a seeker, and uh, um, I followed individuals such as Deepak Chopra, and he's quoted Einstein as having said, he wants to know the mind of God. And I went to see the movie uh, Angels and Demons, and so I, you know, I'm intrigued with this whole idea of religion and quantum science meeting up somewhere and uh, us understanding more about why we're here. But my question is, as I heard the appeal go out about us being more conscious of uh, the, warm, uh, the global warming effect and how important it is to have scientists, how are you scientists going to get together? Because you'll have some scientists that says there is no global warming, and then you'll have others, I guess, because they get a big paycheck saying that you know, there is global warning. Is there an organization that's trying to get you guys together in the room? I'd like to hear a comment from everybody. I'd like to address that. Um, scientists are so human, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> we're not super people. We're not super men. We're not super women. We are not endowed with infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, what? infinite ability. <laughs> We're people. However, the way that science works is that we've understood that, a, that there's a power of a consensus. When you can convince the majority of your community that what you say is correct, that tends to be what ultimately is found in nature. Now, there aren't organizations out there paying scientists to say that the bulk of majority evidence says we are responsible for the heating of the atmosphere. There's no organization out there paying me tonight, for example, for giving this this message. Oftentimes, it's, to me, it's very peculiar that when people make arguments about what scientists say, they don't actually ask the scientist. You know, it would be a very simple thing for Gallup to simply go out on questions like this and simply poll the scientific community and say, how many of you believe that we're the responsible for global warming and how many of you don't? This never seems to occur in the public debate, at least not to my knowledge. And so I can only tell you as a scientist reading the literature, the bulk of my colleagues who are expert in this area of science are convinced by the data. I want to say we got to um, come to a close we're going to have our scientists go out and they're going to have a table. But before we do close, this young lady's hand been up for a long time. And I don't want to close out without having you ask your question. So you better ask the scientists questions outside uh, in the lobby. Go ahead. 
Since this is a beginning for you, what are you going to do in the future? <laughs> well, well, in some sense, you know, we are still doing the same thing that we did when we were your age. I mean, we're still asking really difficult questions. We will continue to ask those questions. We will continue to try to study and to try to understand the answers to those questions because the questions will be the new things. What we do in the future, basically, is not going to be dictated by us. It's going to be essentially what's actually presented by however the world is, is structured, by however the universe evolves. We actually have the skills to be able to answer some of those questions. I was telling people earlier today that I had a lot of confidence in the eighth graders because when we go to Washington, when we make statements and try to give advice to the people who make decisions in our country, um, we pretty much tell them, yes, we have answers to global warming and that sort of thing. We understand how things are, are working. Um, but the answers to the questions that exist now will be answered by eighth graders. We answer questions that we don't know we have a question yet. There are problems that exist now that we do fundamental science, and it will be very helpful for us to be able to have those answers sometime in the future to solve the questions that don't even, that, are, that we don't know exist now. But the questions that do exist now about cancer, about global warming, about certain medical problems, about how we can understand the atmosphere and understand our weather and understand earthquakes, that'll be answered by eighth graders. And all we have to do is support those eighth graders because all of you, like you, who are here on a Friday night listening to people talk about high energy physics and cosmic ray physics are the future for the questions that actually are going to be answered in the future. So you are the future. And you're right, we're just starting out, but we'll continue what we're doing. <laughs> uh, you put the word beginning in your sentence someplace. I'm almost 60 years old. And so it's hard for me to actually think. I know there are people in this room, such as our esteemed guests, who think of 60 as a kid. But I can remember when I was your age, and 60 seems so far away that was Man, farther than going to the stars. <laughs> so when you say the word beginning, all I can say is that I have probably entered the last third of my career as a scientist. And what I'm, it's not what I think of as a beginning, but I'm hopeful that some of the efforts that I have expended in my now 30 years of thinking and doing science, I'm hopeful that I have found something that is magically, mathematically a fact that is also an accurate description of our planet and universe that will be of great value to our species at some point, probably long after I'm gone. So that for me is, if you want to call it beginning, I think of it as my closing, but that's what I'm trying to do. Let's give our guests a round of applause. I want to thank each of you for coming out. I want to say before you leave, this has been a great time, a great evening. We thank Miss Juliana uh, Richardson and the history makers and the science makers and uh, the St. Louis Science Center. Um, Carl G. Wilson said that education is not merely the impartation of knowledge, but education is also the communication of an experience to a race. And we have been truly educated tonight. So if you want to go outside, the, the science is going to go out to their respective places. If you have questions for them, you can ask them questions out there. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. Um, your, your um, what are those? Evaluations. Oh, no, we have to be built yes, what do, you, what do you want? At the door. Please fill them out. You have a history maker uh, at the door, Mr. Timothy Williams, and give them to him. Please take the time and fill them out. Thank you. <laughs>